Bernie. Thank you for Kathy T and for Mary and our children and youth ministry for making that possible. Sermon title, What Do We Do Now? What do we do now? The disciples have placed their trust and their hope in Jesus. For 400 years, the heavens had been silent. And all of a sudden, they hear one who would come in the name of the Lord. And so hope has been restored. But what do you do when the one you hoped in was betrayed and beaten by the Roman authorities and the religious folk? What do you do? What do you do when you choosing to follow this one meant that your folks, your family, said we would want to have nothing to do with you? Because we think he's a lunatic. What do you do when you expected him the one who healed others to be the one who would not endure suffering and to not die. What do you do? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I want to just talk a little bit about practicing our faith processing through life, and then finally proclamation, the proclaiming the good news. Amen? Amen? Practicing our faith. See, the value of a faith is only valuable if you practice it. To say that you are a member of a team and you don't put on the uniform, you don't practice, somebody might question, are you really on the team? The value of practicing your faith is it helps you when you don't know what to do or you can't do what you are supposed to do. Um, when you cry, you cry out. Cry out to whom? We cry out to the Lord. Amen? From whence cometh our help? As they would say in the Psalms, above the mountains, that's who we cry out to. If you find yourself on the ash heaps like Job, because he went through some things, you know how to be angry, but then you can say, naked I came and naked I will go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then, when you find yourself overjoyed, like David was when it was time to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, into that holy place, he danced so much, it was as if he danced off his clothing, and it was something when the regal, the royal, dance before the Lord as to take up all the pretenses like I have on today. That's when you practice your faith, not religion, but your faith. Mary practiced a part of her faith. You see, Jesus had to die before Passover. He had to right there, he had to die at a certain time. And because that happened, he didn't get the proper burial arrangements 
taking care of preparing his body for funeral, for, for death. Now we say that as we look at the book and we work our way through it. But some of us will remember that a woman named Mary <coughs> broke her alabaster box yeah. and put some nard on his feet. And with her tears and her hair, she wiped his feet. And when it was time, Jesus told all the folks who had something to say, leave her alone, for she has prepared me for my burial. God always makes provisions, but he gives us an opportunity to practice our faith. And so it's early in the morning. She goes and she prepares his body, so she thinks. I'm glad for that. Because there are some times we just have to go through the motion. Some people say, fake it till you make it. But you're not being sincere. You're right. But I'm being all I can be right now. Sometimes I can't pray so I have to hold up my hands. Sometimes I have to moan. But I'm doing what I know to do. What I've been taught to do. What I saw someone else do. Until I know for sure, Lord, is this what I'm supposed to do? Right. And that's what she did. She did. And I'm glad for her. Because, see, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If she had known everything, she would have never had to go to the tomb. But she didn't know. She had faith. And so she went. And she followed the process that she knew best. And in doing so, had an opportunity to have an encounter with the Almighty. Amen? Amen. So practice your faith. Read the Word of God. And if you fall asleep, give thanks to God for peace <laughs> and for rest. It happens sometimes. If you pray, remember, pray, adore God. Confess, give thanks, lift up prayers for other people as supplication. Those are acts that take place. And if you want to impact, you intercede, you meditate, and then you lift up petitions. Then you have all of that, and that's an impact that takes place. Amen? <laughs> Practice your faith. Second thing is the processing. So there she goes to complete a process for burial. And when she goes in, whoa, that stone has been moved away. <clears throat> she has some problems. Oh, no. What's going on here? You see, we know the other side of the story. But if the stone had been removed by the Roman authorities, that's okay, because they needed to do that to dispute the fact that he was the king of kings. The religious leaders needed to make sure the stone would have been removed so he couldn't be the Messiah. But they didn't move the stone. See, our Lord and our God had the stone moved. If we hear another gospel lesson, I love it because it talked about the stone being moved and the angel just sitting there chilling. <laughs> I love that. When the Almighty <coughs> knows how to do powerful things, not only in the heavens, but on the earth. But processing. So she does something very wise. She runs back, and she doesn't process alone. A lot of times we go through life's experiences, and we find ourselves processing alone, isolating ourselves. And when we do, we find ourselves in a more dangerous situation. 
than we would be in finding those that we can process together with. I love coming to the church in my times of joy and sorrow and crisis. I had so many people saying, James, we'll, we, we got this. You don't need to come. I said, but I need to come. Yes. Amen. Amen. I need to find refuge in my Lord and God. I know God is at all places at all times, but we sanctified this fellowship hall yes. to be the house of our Lord and our God. Amen. Amen. This is a place where when I can't experience it anywhere else, I know here I can need to be reminded of Hebrews 10 and 25 when it says for us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. This is where we pray for each other. Yes. This is where we encourage each other. This is where we admit we're not perfect and we need God and we need each other. Amen? Amen. So she runs back and she gets the others. They have moved the stone in his body, I don't know where he is. And they start to run. She ran, and they started running. And the processing is so important. Just to let you ladies know, guys would do what we do. The brothers were competing to run to the, to the site. That's just what we do. But we also know that the author of the Gospel of John pointed out the fact he made it there first. <laughs> <laughs> and so he went on in. What is important for us to see is that when they went in, each of them had different experiences. Some of us, when we go in and we see things, we need evidence. And others of us need experiences. Evidence, experiences. But both are places where we can find God. Both are places where, where we have an opportunity to say, I can hang my head right here until I learn more, till I know more, till you reveal more to me, God. And it's still a good process that needs to take place. Going in is important. It's like, well, why is it important to know that the head shroud was here and the lower shroud was here and that it was neatly packed away? I let you know. He kind of walked on through that and set it to the side. It wasn't in shambles. It was organized. Our God is a God of order. Amen? Amen. Even in chaotic situation, heartbreaking situation, God is that kind of God. <clears throat> and I love what, what it said. It was at that point that John believed. Because he had not believed. He had not believed. I don't know about y'all, but that's good news for me. To be one of the disciples, one of the homeboys, the one who was closest to Jesus, hears the story, and right in front of him, he doesn't believe, he goes in a way, he starts to, he gets the evidence, and boom! Oh! This is what he said when he would die, and in three days be, rolled, uh, be raised again. They hadn't heard of resurrection. We hear of it, but if resurrection was the first time over there. I know Lazarus was lifted up, but they'd have called that a healing, a miracle. And he was called back home to the grave and then to heaven himself. But that's a little different. He believed. What did Peter do? He had an experience. Again, he did his thing and went on. Went on back. Mary had a whole different experience. She stayed. She wept. 
And I'm glad for that. Because there are times our hearts break beyond what our head says. And because she did, she sees the folks thinking they're gardeners. You know, hey, just tell me where you have taken his body and laid it just so I can prepare it. And again, she does it, but this time, she hears a different woman. Why are you weeping? Hold on now. I know I know that voice. John 10 would let us know that the good shepherd knows the sheep. And the sheep know the good shepherd. They know the voice of the good shepherd. He's not like a hireling. A hireling will tough, uh, times get tough, jets, pew. But not a good shepherd. Woman, why? Why is it that you are weeping? Not just crying, but why are you weeping from the death of who you are? And what does she do? Rabona! Master, teacher, the one I trusted in. Whoa! That is so beautiful. I want you to know you may not always see, you won't see the presence of Jesus in that way or hear his voice in that way. But Jesus, the Spirit of God, is in each of us. The Imago Day is in us to witness to the Almighty God, to express love, kindness, and mercy to each of us. I need hope that we'll continue to be those instruments who will help people process. And I will tell you, to remember what Francis of Assisi has said as I go to my next point. <clears throat> Preach the good news. And sometimes use words. Did you hear me? Preach the good news. And then every now and then use the word. Every now and then open your mouths. But other than that, preach with your lives, your handshakes, your hugs, helping others when they need it the most. At the last part of the First Corinthians text, it tells us that what they did, and they proclaimed the good news so that people could believe. Jesus, as he has his encounter, with Mary, I love it. She was ready to go hug him, hold on to him. And he told her, do not hold on to me, for I have not ascended to the Father yet. I want us to not only hear Jesus saying that of his body, I want us to release some things and not hold on to some things that we're holding on so that they can be released to God. Be redeemed. And then we can be reconciled, restored, renewed to new life. Amen? Proclaim. So go back and tell my brothers <coughs> that I am ascending. But why do they need to know that? Because that means I'm not dead. <laughs> and then what I said is happening. Good news. First Corinthians let us know 
it wasn't just for Mary, it wasn't just for John, it wasn't just for Peter. They went on to talk to, he went on to talk to a number of people. Why? Evidence that he did get up. Why is that important? Other people have died and remained dead. Our hope is that he died and he was resurrected. And that it pleased God to make that so. I know we get upset. How is it that God would allow him to suffer? Well, he needed to do it because he loves us. He needed to do it so that when we suffer, we might know he identifies with us in our suffering. That when we cry, he cries. When we laugh, he laughs. He's not just an immovable God who doesn't care. The old folks say he sits high and he looks low. If you hear the psalm says, he inclines his ear, leans down us. So proclaim the good news. Proclaim the good news that he is risen. risen Not really, I just want you to know he is risen. Because <laughs> there's some stuff that needs to die so it can be resurrected anew. He is risen. He is risen and then there are some loved ones who have gone on to glory. They have taken off mortality and put on immortality. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more disease. And so now we can be a people who grieve, but grieve with hope. Why? Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Proclaim that good news. Proclaim that good news. I didn't know on Monday when I was called to officiate the funeral of a sister that I would hear of how she nurtured her children through some very difficult situations and how that moment of just being a vessel to proclaim the good news would bless them, but bless me too. All right. And then at 3.30, when I was called to officiate my brother JJ's service with others, I I didn't know how it was going to affect me and why it was so important to proclaim the good news. JJ said, don't even lift me up, lift Jesus. <laughs> proclaim the good news. This is a service of resurrection. Point people to Jesus. And you know what he did? He said, the final song that we sang we had to take some keys out. All right. And when we took the keys out, he said, my daddy used to make sure that we arrived at the settings we were going to early. And when it was time for us to go, he would yeah. bring on his keys. Yeah. You, know, you know, you have to do something to let everybody know it's time to go. I'm not going to announce it to everybody else. This is a family secret. For the ring of the keys, it's time to go. But daddy! I'm, now I'm bringing it out here. You better get over here. Because he said, when you finish this service, I want you to take the keys and I want you to go. And I want you to go and do good works in the name of the Lord. And the name of JJ's club was the Fight Club. In dying, galvanized folks from every state in the United States and from other countries. 
He fought the good fight of faith. This morning at 3.50, I had to say goodbye to someone I love. But she fought the good fight of faith. When you leave here, dangle your keys. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't get caught up in religious debates because not one person on this earth died for your sins. Died to reconcile you to the Father. Loved you beyond extended mercy new every morning. Someone may hurt you in the church. Someone may hurt you in government. But God reigns above them all with all power and might. He's the one who gives us hope in times of trials and tribulation. Yeah. Is he playing Rocky? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing purple today for Christus Victor. That's Christ who is victorious. Victorious over death victorious over the grave. Though we fight, we say against flesh and blood, Ephesians will let us know that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, things of high places, those little things that try to push us to the place where we can't see the people we love for all the other stuff. Jesus took that power away from them. And you know what he did? He gave us the keys. Yeah. The keys of the kingdom. He said with these kings, keys, you can bind things on earth that are already bound in heaven. Yeah. And you can lose things on earth that are already loose in heaven. Use your keys, y'all. Yeah. If you forgive someone, they don't forgive you. Why? Because he gave the keys. As I go to my seat, time to go. And when we go, go victorious. Go in the name of the Lord, our God. Proclaim the good news. He is risen. He is risen no, really, really. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. God bless you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being faithful and just for being loving and kind, for suffering so that we would know that we aren't the only ones who suffer. And you don't have any joy in it, but you know how to redeem it. So that your, be your babies who have choice can choose and say yes. And in saying yes, you abide with them in us. Be our all in all. Be our hope this day and every day we pray. Amen. Amen.